It is the final week of Start Again. And so we've been doing this series and we've been talking about resting in the finished work of the cross. And um, I'm excited that we had Charles, uh, I, you know, I think I started off the, the series and then uh, Charles came and brought a powerful word. And then last week, if you missed last week, you need to go back and watch it because Matthew Hester was here and Matthew Hester the most calmest preacher I know had my brain folded in five million different ways because he was just dropping bombshells, and I was like, oh, my word. And I, now, I love when a preacher can just, you know, just, just make you think, right? Um, and uh, so uh, you need to go back and watch that if you didn't watch it. It's available in our app. It's available online on YouTube. You can probably scroll down the timeline on the church page and find it, watch the whole service. But it was a great, great week. And so I want to finish this series off by, um, by just uh, sharing a word that God put on my heart some time ago, but I've been wrestling through it. And, uh, and I believe it's a word for us in this season. Amen and for where we're headed and what God is doing is specifically in Prevail Church. And so I want to dive into that. Thank you guys. Um, again, if you're watching online, if it's your first time watching, thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for letting us know. If you don't mind, go over to live.prevail.tv. Let Caitlin know that you are here for the first time, and we want to just say thank you, and she'll, she'll handle all that out. So Caitlin's probably one of the most awesome people you'll meet in your life, so you need to go on over there and talk to her and let her know that you're here. Thank you guys for being here. We have some new folks that, that came, and um, I know they, they are a uh, family of some of our folks here, so thank you all for joining us. We're glad that you are here today. And I heard that little one singing, and I was like, yes, come on, somebody. And so... Uh, Anyways, let's, let's dive into it. Let's get into this message. I want to turn, uh, turn to Genesis chapter 35. And we're going to read uh, a good amount of verses right now, but we're going to dive into it. I think first I might have Genesis 28, 15, um, and then we'll go to Genesis 35. So let's, let's start with Genesis 28 and 15. And it says this in the New King James Version. It says, Behold, I am with you. And will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land. Somebody say, back to this land. Say that loud. Say, back to this land. Say it real loud. Say, back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Verse 30, uh, chapter 35, verses 1 through 15. We got a little bit of verses to read, so get ready. Amen. It says this, it says, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and all to, the, uh, all to who were there with him, Put away foreign gods that are among you, that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem, whatever that word is, I messed that word up. And they journeyed, and, ter and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is, the land, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all his people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel. Because God appeared to him when he fled the face of his brother. Now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. Listen, just want to point out a couple of things. They buried or they hid the false gods and earrings under the terebinth tree in Shechem, and then Deborah died, and she was buried under this terebinth tree in 
Bethel. This tree is also called the Oak of Weeping. Come on now. It's, there's something there. I'll, I'll go there. So he called the place uh, Alon, whatever that word is. And then God, <laughs> then God appeared to Jacob again. And when he came to, uh, man, these words, Padam Aram, and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after uh, you I give this land. Then God went up from the place and where he talked with them. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with God, a pillar of stone, and he poured out a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. Somebody say Bethel. I'm going to preach a message today called The Way Back, The Way Back. Lord, thank you for what you're going to say. Pray that you will be in this place today in Jesus' name. Amen. Throughout the Bible, we, um, we are invited um, to a handful of instances where we see God changes the name of his servants. Um, Abraham, uh, Abram became Abraham. Sarai, Sarai became Sarah. Uh, Simon became Peter. Uh, many times, just a handful of instances where we see a name being changed. But many times, and most, one of the most memorable name changes is that one of this account where Jacob has become Israel. And it's memorable because it's, it's, uh, it's accompanied not with just a name change, it's accompanied with a battle. Uh, a battle between man and God, a wrestle between this man and God. The account goes like this, a mysterious man. Uh, some scholars say that this mysterious man was actually the incarnate Christ himself, which was Jesus walking the earth at this time, uh, comes and standing before Jacob. And they begin to wrestle. And the Bible says they wrestled until daybreak. First of all, I don't know if you've ever been in a wrestling match, but about five minutes in, I'm like, I'm done, I'm good, I'm, you know. And, uh, but they wrestled all night long. Have you ever found yourself wrestling with God? Wrestling with what God is saying to you, what he's asking of you, wanting of you, desiring from you? A lot of times we find ourselves in a very long battle with God because we know God is asking of something or desiring something or challenging us or pulling us some way. But a lot of times, we find ourselves resisting or trying to wrestle. But now, this wasn't so much a, a, a wrestle of resistance for Jacob. Jacob was wrestling this man, and the Bible uh, describes it that Jacob was pretty much holding on for dear life. And he would not let go. And when the man or the angel realized it, uh, he touched Jacob's socket, touched him on the hip. Hit him right there, mm, just like that. Mm, that sounded like Kevin Hart. Mm. And when he hit him, he, mm. and next thing you know, he was walking with a limp. Somebody say a limp. He gave him a lifelong limp. From, this day, from that day on, Jacob knew, was marked with a limp when wrestling with God. I, I want to I pause for a minute and just, and just throw something in here that sometimes the mark of God on your life may look painful to others, right? The stuff that you've gone through, the stuff that you've faced, the, 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 the ups and downs, the trials and the tribulations, it, it may look painful to other people because you've journeyed through it and you know the pain yourself. And, and, and people from the outside may not know what you really went through or what you really have been facing, and it may look painful to others. But I want to remind you to let it serve for you as a memory, a memory of what God has done and where God changed everything. Amen. 
You can't look at your trials and your tribulations and the things that you've made it through and you know it was only by the grace of God. Don't look at that and, and, and be, uh, you know, succumb to the pain. Look at it and say, that is where God changed everything. Somebody say changed everything. So the man, he touches Jacob's hip. Jacob becomes out. Now he's got a limb and he's, uh, you know, he hit him mm, just like that. And the man told Jacob this. Uh, he looked at Jacob. He said, you got to let me go. He said, let me go. It's almost daybreak. And Jacob's response was this. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Somebody say bless me. I want to pause for the calls one more time here, and I want to encourage you that it's okay to have the tenacity and the courage to pull on God, to place a demand on God to bless you. Amen. See, we, we, we've been, I, I feel like in the church we've been taught wrong. We've been taught so many times in so many ways that in, that in God's eyes, that we're really nothing. But how do you know that Christ would not die for nothing? In God's eyes, you're actually everything. You're in God's eyes, you're actually all that in a bag of chips. Amen. Because He's invited you to the table. When He sees us, He sees His children. How many of you, if you got kids, look at your kids and go, I don't care nothing about y'all. You don't do that. No matter how bad your child can be, amen, and they can be bad. Come on, somebody. I got two of them. They know how to turn the house upside to the down, amen. But I don't never look at them and think, oh, you know what? I don't really, nah. And I never want to present a, or build an environment where they don't think they can come ask me for something. Where they don't think they can come and, and look at me and say, Dad, I need this, or can you get me this, or something. And so, we, but see, we built an environment like this in church where we believe that God, that we got to tiptoe around God all the single time, and we can't really ask him for anything. Jacob looked at him, he said, I will not let go until you bless me. Somebody say until. I love it because that's, that's some heart, some courage right there when you can just look at God and say, I, I, I ain't going nowhere until you bless me. <laughs> what? Wait a minute. Hold up. Pause, bro. No, I ain't going nowhere. And so this is what I love, though, because, he, he, you know, that in the middle of your pain, you can have the tenacity to place the demand on God and say, you can, you, I'm not moving until you get me out of this situation. I'm not, I'm not going to change. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving your presence until you get me out of this situation. So the man looked at him and he said this. He said, uh, and I'm still in this account. He said, uh, he asked Jacob, he said, what is your name? And I love this because if we're talking about this being God, Jesus Christ, we already know that he knows the answer. Right? But for some of us, many of us, change will not actually come in our life until we are truthful about who we really are. I think some of us are still confused about who we are. We want God to bless us, but we don't even know who we are. I wrote this down. I said, God cannot anoint the fake you. God will not bless a copycat. I'm preaching better than y'all yelling because it's so good. And I know it's quiet in the house and I love it when it's quiet because it's good. Because God will not spend time working on you, blessing you, changing you if you won't admit who you really are. And there's so many people in the body of Christ right now walking around fake. 
They got masks on physically and spiritually. Hello. Fake. Can't really, you don't know who they is. One minute they, you know, we ain't going to go there. If we really want God to bless us, we got to get real about who we are. Amen? You see, God knows who you are. He's fully aware of you, your shortcomings, your doubts, your fears, all of that stuff. So why would we hold out or hide from who God's calling us to be? God will not bless the fake you. Jacob responds with his name. He says, I'm Jacob. My name is Jacob. And the man looks at him and says, not anymore. Somebody say, not anymore. From this point on, you shall be called Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Somebody say, prevailed. Come on. See, Jacob's an interesting character in Scripture. Honestly, if Jacob were around today as Jacob and not Israel, I don't believe Jacob would be readily accepted by most in the Christian community. Jacob, as Jacob, wouldn't show up on your conference rosters. Uh, he wouldn't be a best-selling Christian artist or a Christian writer. Come on, somebody. He wouldn't make the Christian billboards. billboards, uh, And he probably wouldn't make much of Christian anything. Jacob was a handful and a half. Amen. So we got to, as we're, as we're working through this, and I, and I got some things I want to declare with you that I believe the Lord gave me um, for today, but I want to work through a couple of things right quick because we got to look at Jacob in two different areas of his life. There's Jacob and then there's Israel. Somebody say Jacob and Israel. Jacob... Um, the name Jacob means the supplanter, so, supplanter, or he, or it means overreach, or coming from behind. It was always like second place, or, or as many of us know that Jacob means trickster. Trickster. He was he was always you know pulling the rug off from under your feet, so to speak. Amen. So from birth, when we think about Jacob, as Jacob, we, from birth, he was always working to try and be first. He was always working to try and be seen or to be affirmed. Uh, he always fought with his brother, and he tried to be first. I mean, from the womb. Esau's coming out, Jacob grabs his foot like, nah, bro. <laughs> Trying to be first. He, he tricked his brother uh, to get his birthright, to get the blessing of his father. He was a con man. His life was marked by works. See, this is, this is, the, this is the reality of, of Jacob. Before this encounter with Jesus, his life was marked by works. He spent so much time trying to be seen, trying to be affirmed, trying to get attention of those around him, working and working and working and working. I mean, the man worked even for his wives. He worked for seven years because he wanted to marry one girl, and then the girl's dad tricked him, gave him the other daughter. That won't happen today, amen. <laughs> Showing out, I'm burning your house down. The cattle, everything going. So he marries, he marries the first daughter because he's strict. And then the guy talks him into working another seven years. So 14 years. 14 years this dude worked for the wives that he had. And one of them he didn't even want. The Bible says that he didn't even love her. Leah and Rachel. He was, he was in love with Rachel, but he didn't really like Leah. So he spent seven years working for something that he didn't even love. 
Have you ever done that? Have you ever spent time at the time at the time, and you don't realize it until you're on the other end of it a lot of times, but you spend your energy, your time, and this is what we do when we don't have Christ as the center of our life. When we don't, when we spend our lives uh, spending our wills and working out of our own actions and out of our own works and trying to get in God good graces and trying to get God to be pleased with us. And when we try to put our own works and our own righteousness, we realize and we end up realizing that we don't even love the life that we're living. This is why it's so easy for people to fall away from Christ and walk away from the church when they get to a certain age because they spend their life working and working only to realize that they never really love Christ. They love the idea of church, but never really love Christ. So he works for seven years for a promise for, uh, to Rachel and was deceived by Laban, who, and, and he switched Leah for Rachel, and then he works another seven years. If I say seven years, that's a lot of time. Come on, somebody. Me and Aaron got married two months. After we met, so I'm gonna talk to her dad. He'd be like, bro, you gotta wait seven years. And not only do you have to wait, you gotta come live at my house and work on my land. I'd be like, there's another errand out there somewhere. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I would have fought for you, baby. Seven years is a long time, though. He worked for additional seven years to marry Rachel, and then. And then the Bible goes, oh, listen, this one, I'm, I'm trying to paint this picture that as Jacob, his life was marked by works. It was marked by anger and sadness and work. I mean, just terrible. His first four sons came from Leah. The first four sons of his life came from a person that he didn't even love. And the Bible says that clearly he did not love. He did not love her. Scripture was very clear about that. Leah knew it. She was giving birth to sons to try to get him to love her. But he did not love her. I want to 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 put this out there for you that works will always produce things that we do not love. Works will always produce things that we do not love. Cuz when you come into a real revelation of who Christ is, and how much he loves you, how much he cares for you, you begin to look back and you'll go, why was I doing the things that I was doing? Why was I wasting my time? See, works to produce things that you don't love, and sometimes it, it, Leah was naming every one of his sons out of her own pain. We've invested our lives in many times. If we don't get a revelation of who Christ is and the finished work of Christ, we will spend our life locked to things that was birthed out of pain. Now, here's the, here's the beautiful thing. God can still bless those things. Because God gave him a word, said, I'm, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Like, coming from you is going to be great nations. Your, things are, and when we think about the church today, it came from Israel. Come on, children of Israel, tribe of Judah, all of this came from Israel. But it came from great pain. And it came from when he had the transit. If he had not had an encounter with the church wouldn't be here today. This is Jacob, the supplanter. This is what we are for a lot of us. This is before we have a revelation. And this is what I want you to get. This is what I want you to get if you don't get anything else today. You need a revelation of the love of a gracious father, a love of a good king, a, the love of a father who will wrestle with you all night long to change the very core of who you are, who will not give up on you, who will tell you exactly who he's called you to be if you do not give up. Amen. So we got Jacob the supplant and then we got Israel. Somebody say Israel. The prevailer. 
The Bible says, your name shall be Israel because you have prevailed with God. Somebody say prevail. Somebody say we prevail. I love this because this is one of my favorite scriptures because the reality is it's only until we get a revelation of who God is that we will actually overcome the things in our life that we need to overcome. And we can fight all day long. We can get in there and go at it and battle with our issues and battle with our sins and try and try and try and try and try. But it is not until you switch your attention from your wrestle with your sin issue to your wrestle with who God is that nothing can actually change. Because your issue, your sin issue is not going to define who you are. It is your Lord and Savior that defines who you are. Come on, somebody. You understand? And we can't spend our time fighting, trying to change things without the work and the help of Jesus Christ. See, Israel the prevailer had, listen to this, and this is what we need to flip here because when he got this revelation, when he had this moment with Jesus, the Bible says he changed his name to Israel, Israel the prevailer. Here's what some of the things that happened when the name was changed. He now had an assurance of victory by God, by his name Israel. See, prior to the encounter, he was afraid of meeting his brother Israel, I mean Esau, because he had tricked Esau. Esau was mad. Esau told him, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to hunt you now. I'm, I'm after you, bro. Come on. And when God told him to go back to the land the first time, they sent word to Esau. And Esau got 400 men and started coming for him. Somebody said coming for him. How many of you know, listen, listen, sometimes your past will try and come for you. Amen. But, but, but he had this moment with God, this moment. And the Bible says that now he had an assurance of victory. See, before this encounter, he, he was afraid of meeting his brother Esau, and he sent his family ahead to have a personal fellowship with God. And God said to him in, in verse 28, he said, For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Somebody say, have prevailed. His mind was still clouded with fear and doubt to meet his brother after the encounter, but God cannot lie. He's a man of his word. And because the Bible says this, the Bible told him, you have prevailed. Somebody say, have prevailed. See, when God looks at our situation, he looks at it as past tense. Because God is not with us. Uh, he's, not, he's with us in the present, but he's also acquainted with our future. And God knows that we won the battle. The Bible says that it is finished. And when God gave him the word that, and changed his name, he also told him that, listen, don't worry about that. Your past is not going to catch up with you. Your past is not going to take you out. It's not going to be the end. I have declared that you are, you have victory. Somebody said he already had victory. And Esau was after him, but God's word was on them. And when we get to verse, when we get to chapter 35 and they start making their trek back, the Bible says that every place around them, every place around them was, was shaken. And they were, uh, you know, they were looking, they were going crazy because they could not get there. They couldn't mess with the children of Israel. Why? Because God had placed a hedge of protection around them. And I want you to hear me. When you know who God is, there's a hedge of protection around you. And though your past may be making threats and may be trying to come at you, I came to announce to you today that you will not be shaken by those things, that God has your back. The name Israel also means, is another name by which, uh, is another means by which God entered into a divine covenant with Israel. With Jacob. Hear me, listen to this. Part of the reason you need this revelation of Christ is because you need a renewal of your covenant with Christ. Some of us are still trying to live out a relationship with God under the old covenant. Come on, somebody. When Christ came and died for us, the Bible says that he fulfilled the law. 
Can I give you some, some theology here for a minute? Let me, let, me break, let me break this down. He fulfilled the law. Every aspect of the law was fulfilled in Christ. But Christ went as a representation of us. So when he died and fulfilled the law, guess what else? We died with him. The Bible says that when we die, when Christ died, we all die. All of us die. And then when he got up, we all got up. Now when, Christ, when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin issue. He sees the blood of Jesus. Come on, somebody. And many of us have spent a lot of times trying to keep the law when we need to walk under grace. See, it's a divine covenant. Like his predecessors, Abraham, Abraham and Isaac, Abraham and Isaac's name came directly from God, not from man. Israel is a name from God, while Jacob, as a name, came from men with, uh, with all the circumstances. But when God gets in your life, he changes your everything. And when God changes it, a new covenant is made. Come on. And you got to recognize that he's made a new covenant with us. And so, Israel and Jacob, two different worlds. But how many of you know sometimes we get a name change? See, this name change actually happened in chapter 32. But when we read verse in chapter 35, we hear God telling him to go back to Bethel. Somebody say, the way back. Actually, if you, if you back up to 28, chapter 28, Jacob has just ran and running and fleeing from Esau. And he's... he's He's scared for his life. He's leaving. And he gets to this place, Luz, again, Luz, whatever it's called. And then he gets there, and, and this is where he lays down. He lays his head on a rock. And he begins to have this dream. He begins to have this dream of a stairway from heaven. And the Bible says... That he sees angels up and down. And he wakes up and God makes these promises to him. He says, I'm going to bless you. There's going to be a nation there. That, you know, I, I, from you, there are all these people coming. He basically looked at him and said, bro, you're going to have a lot of children. I'm going to bless you because you're going to need it. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to make you great. I'm going to do all these things. And the Bible says that Jacob, in that moment, names that place Bethel. It says, how awesome is this place? God is here. I'm going to name this Bethel. And he called, it's called the place of God. Someone say the place of God. So then we get to chapter 32. Jacob done work. He done did all this stuff. And then he has this encounter. Listen, he's been blessed. Because he got the children and all this stuff. He has his encounter with God. Wrestle, changes his name. God tells him he's Israel now. And then we get to chapter 35. His name changed in 32. But he's still going by Jacob in 35. Kids, tribes, grandchildren, everything, all this stuff. Later. He's still going by Jacob. I know some of y'all, maybe you don't do this, but every now and then you can find me at my old self. Come on, somebody. Knowing the promises of God, knowing what he said to me, knowing who I'm called to be, sometimes you can still find me at my old address, as Bishop would say. And sometimes God keeps trying to change us and trying, he keeps telling us who we are, but we keep finding ourselves at our old place. So he, he gets to verse 30, chapter 35, and God tells him, I need you to go back. Somebody say, go back. Go back. 
And as I begin to read this, the Lord began to give me a few declarations, and I wanted to make these declarations over you guys this morning. But here's the first thing is that you're going from being Jacob to being Israel. You're going from Jacob to Israel. You wrestle for notoriety from men, but now you're going to wrestle for a blessing from God. You're going from Jacob to Israel. Somebody say, I'm going from Jacob to Israel. That is the reality, folks. The greatest battle in your life is not between, uh, you, you know, you and your finances. It's between who you are and who God's called you to be. And a lot of us keep finding ourselves over and over at the place of Jacob when God is asking you to be Israel. Come on. 32, chapter 32, your name is Israel. Chapter 35, he's still going by Jacob. And that is the battle of our life, that we keep going back and forth with who we used to be when God is telling us who we will be and who we are. Come on, somebody. I'd like to declare this over you, too, is that you're no longer going to settle for being close to the place of promise. You're going to be in the place of promise. See, as God gets to him uh, at 35, we find out that Jacob has, in fact, heard God before tell him to go back. But he didn't go all the way back. You know, he went to this place called Shechem. And Shechem, if you, think, if you know anything about Bible stuff, Shechem is about 30 miles away from where God told him to actually go. He literally is living on the edge of his promise. 30 miles from the place of promise. 30 miles from the place of protection. 30 miles from where God is going to change his life forever. 30 miles from where he got his revelation of who God is. 30 miles. 30 miles. We got to stop being okay with being close to the presence of God, close to the place of promise, close to what God is saying. Oh, I'm okay as long as I'm good. And I'm, no, you don't need to be good. You need to be in the place of promise. You need to be exactly where God wants you to be. And listen, here's the thing. When you get to that place, the object of your worship will be corrected. Your relationships will be mended. And you'll be reminded of who God says you are. You'll be reminded that you'll live by that. You'll live by who God says you are. You won't live by your pain. You won't live by your battles, your defeat. Any of that you'll live by exactly who God called you to be. Not only that is when you get into the, the place of promise of who God called you to be, your family will know the true God. It's time for us to stop settling for being close to the promise. I don't want to live my life almost believing, almost knowing that God, I don't, want to, I don't want to get sick and believe that God could almost heal me. I want to be in a place of promise where I know my Savior lives and I know that my Savior is for me and I know he has called and he has great works and great things in store and I don't want to live my life close to the promise of God or to the presence of God. I want to be in his presence. Somebody say in his presence. Man, I felt that strong when I was reading and studying this thing and I realized that he was so close. 30 miles. 30 miles. That was less than a week's journey. And in that time, walking was okay. 30 miles he could have been, but he was so succumbed to his fear of his past and the pain of his past that he settled for being close but not in. Man, see, when you get a revelation of who God is, you won't be directed by your fear. You'll be directed by his voice. I want to declare this over to you, over you, that you're going from Bethel. 
to El Belter. Somebody say El Belter. Now, what in the world? This sounds like the same thing, but here's what you got to know. See, Bethel was called the place of God. El Bethel was the God of the place of God. One encounter, he learned and knew the place of God. The next encounter, he learned the God of the place of God. What am I trying to say? You've known church for a long time. You've known religion for a long time. You've known how to walk and do the things and put the face on and go to church and smile. Hi, I'm blessed and holy, baby. Amen, hallelujah, God, thank you. You've known that for a while, but this is the time, and I'm declaring to some of you right now, that you're about to have an encounter with Jesus Christ, and it's not going to be just church. You're going to know God. You're going to know Jesus. It is time. Uh, the, the time is past. It is over. It is way past time for us to get a relationship with God. I am tired of seeing people walk away from church. Why? Because the church is messed up. And I know some folk going to come for me and they're going to be all mad. But we have made the church everything that God did not call us to make it. We've made it political. We've made it uh, uh, this and that. We've made it judgmental. Everything lines up. Our faith lines with our politics or our politics determine our faith. All of this stuff. And we live in a time now where you can't even begin to love people like they should be loved because you're so directed by these outsources that you don't know the truth. God oh I'm preaching I'm preaching and it's time God is about to shift some things there's a change coming and I want you to hear me and I'm declaring this prophetically over the church that we are about to encounter God we are about to encounter Jesus Christ, the God of the house, not just the house, the God of the house. I don't want to come to church and not know Jesus. Jesus said, when some of them are going to stand before me and I'm going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Notice what he says. That it's not about how much you go to church. It's about your relationship with him. Some of us think we're going to die and go to heaven because we went to church all of our life. And you're going to buzz hell wide open because you didn't know Jesus. With gasoline underwear. Come on, somebody. I believe God is calling us to a day where we need to get close to him. Not to an organization. Not to a status quo. Not to a, a, a political party. Not to a, 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 a Facebook group. None of that. We got to get close to him. Somebody say him. Last prophetic declaration is this. You will no longer be marked by sorrow. Your life will no longer be marked by sorrow. Be marked by grace. Somebody say grace. You'll see this changing. Somebody say you'll see this changing. You'll no longer be working from pain. You'll be seated in heavenly places with Jesus at the right hand of the Father. It's time to rest. The last son of Israel... Benjamin. His name was first going to be Ben Oni, whatever Ben Oni. His mom was going to name him Ben Oni, which means son of my sorrow. Somebody say, son out of my sorrow. That's what she was going to name him. Israel stepped in and said, no, 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 no. He's going to be called Benjamin. Here's another name change. Ooh, listen, listen. When you get a revelation of who Christ, you begin to name this stuff in your life. And he says, I'm not calling him Ben only. I'm calling him Benjamin, which means son at my right hand. When we get to exploring scripture, we see Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus is seated He's, set, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. There is a time. See, revelation of who Christ is changes everything. 
It changes your seat, positions you to know who Christ is. Amen? I want to share a story with you right quick. Can I share this with you? And then we're going to be gone. Y'all ready for this? I'm going to try to read this without crying, but listen. In 2017, I was personally in a very painful place. I was pastoring Prevail Church, which at the time was known as the meeting place. And I remember crying out to the Lord on multiple occasions concerning where I was personally and where I was in ministry. I remember working so hard to try and make the meeting place a successful church. I spent countless hours trying to figure out how to recruit the right people coin the right and catchy vision and mission statements, secure the right equipment, uh, create the right processes, create the right graphics, uh, plan a mistake-free Sunday morning service, partner with the right community partners and create the right videos, and the right backdrops, getting good with the right network so I can be affirmed by the right people. So much more. I spent over three years working to maintain this view of perfection, all while hiding this, this feeling, this ongoing feeling of feeling like a failure because all of my efforts weren't successful by my standards. In 2017, I took a hard look at my life and the ministry I was leading, and I began to ask the Lord to unravel it all, and I remember praying and asking God to change what he wanted to change, however he wanted to change it. One of the hardest prayers of my life. That year, God began to remind me over and over of a word that I had received at the one-year anniversary of the meeting place from Bishop Tony Miller, and it, was stated, it stated this. It said, one day that we would look back and we would say these words, we prevailed by faith. Somebody say, by faith. We prevail by faith. It was in those moments that I began to wrestle with God about changing the name of the church from the meeting place to prevail church. Now, some of you might be thinking, so what? What's the big deal about changing the name of the organization? Well, you see, my background, my professional background is as a graphic designer. I've worked in marketing for a long time. And I spent a lot of time and a lot of time invested in building the meeting place to where it was. So changing the name of the church was a big deal to me personally because I put so much work into building the brand of the meeting place. And it was, and it was catching on in the community. During that time, I had become known as the pastor of the meeting place, and when I would go somewhere, people were like, oh, I heard about your church, the meeting place, and it felt good. I would smile and be like, yeah, man, that's the only the best church in Greenville, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I would smile, and I would still be feeling like a failure. And as I wrestled with this word in slow obedience, somebody said slow obedience, I received another word from Pastor Antoine, who was on our team at that time. And he looked at me, and he said, God has told me, he's instructed me to tell you, to remind you of a prayer that you prayed, telling God that nothing was off limits. And it took me a while to get what he was saying, but I realized that God was saying nothing was off limits. Church name, all of it. So it took me a while, but I got on board. God designed for my life and the church was renamed to Prevail Church and we celebrated and we were excited and God was doing some great things. Fast, uh, I remember celebrating and being excited and dreaming about the future. It was in that time to also begin to pray about a new location for the church and had dreamed of moving the newly named Prevail Church to Taylor's Mill. Dreamed of it, researched about it, walked through the location, but eventually I chose to move to a different, more convenient location because I believe it would put us in a more visible place where we would be more successful. 
I'm getting somewhere. Don't catch me now. Catch up with me in a minute. Now, even though I had obeyed God and changed the name, my reliance on me and my methods did not change. So I continued to work harder and harder to get more people and fine-tune to perfection for the sake of looking good to the outside world, yet inside I was still feeling like a complete failure. Preaching every Sunday feeling like a failure. Preaching every Sunday leaving afterwards feeling depressed and down and just all kinds of stuff. And I felt like we were never doing enough. Never doing enough. Fast forward to 2018 and everything was pretty solid and going okay and I had found some peace in the fact that our attendance was up, our giving was up, our engagements were up. And um, we, or should I say I, was becoming more known as a pastor in the community. I happily received the praise for our efforts and I let that praise define my life. The pinnacle of all this came when I received a call from a prominent pastor out in the West or the Midwest who had took notice of what was happening here and was interested in exploring the idea of me joining the ranks of their ministry. This was a dream. It was everything. Listen, it was a large stage. It was more people, more recognition, more opportunities to advance my name in ministry. And I was going to be a full-time staff member on a church doing all of this and this church was not just any country it was like multicultural everything it was the church I had dreamed of and the opportunity was perfect and it was mine it was on the table all I had to do was say yes all you gotta do is say no stop. and then I prayed and God said these words stay in Greenfield And I thought, wait a minute. This is an opportunity. But God said, stay in Greenville. And I was distraught and I was disappointed. But I believed it was good because I would continue to work, to build, prevail, and God would bless it. Amen. And I remember sitting in my car having this conversation with Bishop Tony Miller on a Friday night and telling him what God has said to me and I was letting him know that I wouldn't be taking the opportunity that I was going to be turning it down that God told me to stay in Greenville and, 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 uh, and continue to build, prevail and, and uh, Bishop said these words to me he said, listen, he said I'm proud of you bud hold on to that word even if everybody leaves you I thought to myself, well, that's, that's interesting. Why would you even say such a thing? <laughs> We're good, man. Church is going fine. Everybody knew it. Everybody excited. We had just had this cookout. All these people showed up. It was great. I mean, we were seeing people come to church. It was amazing. And I told the pastor that following Monday that I would not take it. That I was not going to take on uh, the position and that I was going to turn it down. And I was great, and I was excited. Told him on Monday, the following Sunday, 13 people showed up to church. 13 people. And nine of them served in various areas. Now, you may be sitting in this room thinking, oh, man, that's nothing. We got less than 13 people here right now. But 13 people showed up. The week before, we had 40, 50, 60, whatever it is. 13 people. Now, in one week, you might be like, oh, man, that's, that's fine. You're good. This went on for months. 13 people or less. When people go on vacation, I felt it. I was like, Lord, dude, don't go on vacation not this week. This would continue for months, and because I was defined by my work of success in ministry, this was a heavy mark on my life and it deepened the roots of feeling like a complete failure in the eyes of God. I felt like I wasn't doing something right. 
felt like I could need to try over and over. I'm, I'm telling y'all, and this is a long story, but I'm getting there, okay? So I tried to work and work to figure out how to get back in the game, and eventually I believed that God was telling me to shift again, that God was done with prevail. He had just, I'm done with it. He told me to shift again, to join forces with a local minister friend to launch a new ministry work. That's what I did. I made my announcement, and the response was on point. Everybody was celebrating. Woo! Yes, it's going to be great. I can't believe y'all two joining. What? Oh, snap. And I was excited. Others were excited. And I conveniently in ignored anyone who told me they didn't think I was doing the right thing or hear from God. Conveniently ignored them. And I believe God has shifted his promise from, for prevail, has shifted from his promise over prevail. This is a great opportunity, guaranteed success, and I believe it would again open so many doors for me personally. At the top of 2019, we launched this ministry, and it was exhilarating. Over 600 people showed up the first night. It was, it was great. And I worked my tail off, and the payoffs were amazing. Gain friends, opportunities, respect, affirmation from permanent, I mean, uh, prominent leaders, etc. Then I began to come into this revelation of grace. And my perspective changed. I had an encounter with Jesus. And my perspective changed. My perspective changed and I saw myself for who I really was. A guy seeking affirmation from everyone and everything except God. See, I believe my success was in the measurable and visible things instead of the simple obedience. And I found myself again wrestling with God. This time, all the, all the successful things weren't enough. Something was missing and I couldn't figure it out. Something was missing, I couldn't figure it out. In June of 2019, we attended the Bethany Conference in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the first night the speaker was reading his scripture, he very quickly read through Genesis 28, the story of this moment when Jacob was fleeing from Esau. Verse 15 hit me like a ton of bricks, and I heard the Lord say this to me. He said, I'm bringing you back to this place. That, that verse, throw that verse up there for me, if you don't mind. Genesis 28, 15. It says, and I'm, I want to read it. Listen, this is what hit me. It said, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. Wherever you go. I'm with you and I'll keep you. However, I will bring you back to this place. Somebody say back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And as I sat there in that room, I began to weep and cry because I knew what the Lord was saying. I knew what God was saying and God was saying, it's time to go replant Prevail Church. It's time to start again. Somebody say start again. Start again. I sat there and I began to weep. Now you may look at it and say, well, y'all got the lights, y'all got all the stuff going on now, but let me tell you something. That's not the driving force. That ain't what's driving anything. You know what's driving me now? What drives me now is this reality that people need an encounter with the true God. With a loving Father. A merciful Savior. So they can really know who God has called them to be. That people need to know that it's not about our works, our righteousness, our anything. It's about Christ. What He's done. The finished work of the cross. Do me a favor, stand up. The 
some of you say, Fred, that was a long behind story. And yes, it was. But it's my story. It's my reality. It's my journey from, is- from Jacob to Israel. It's my slow obedience. It's my knowing what God is asking and walking towards it slowly or settling for being on the outside of it or being close to it but not in it. We all have that story. We all have that story. We all have that story. And if 2020 hadn't challenged you to hear and honor God's voice, I don't know that you're listening to it. Because there is a pull, and I believe right now there is a mandate, a mandate from heaven where he's pulling his people close to him. And it's not about your works. It's not about how many T's you cross and how many I's you dot. It's not about any of that. It's about the finished work of the cross. When Jesus died, he said these words just before he died. It is finished. Come on, can you slip your hands towards heaven just for a moment? Just close your eyes. I need you in the next few moments just begin to pray and say, God, God, what is my story? What are you asking for me, God? Where are you bringing me back? What is my way back? Come on, if you're watching online, ask God those questions. What is my way back? God, what are you asking of me? What is my way back? What is it that you desire? I know you've called me. I know you've made a promise over my life. God, where have I gotten off? Where have I looked at other things except you, God? Where have I tried in my own works to get your blessing? It's time to start again. And I want to decree and declare over some of you that you have been called And God is calling you again. It is time to start again. He wants those those precious moments with you again. Remember those moments when when you first got saved, you would just sit and just cry. Some of us ain't cried in years. Or you felt close to the Lord. You knew that he was for you. But life happens. God, I thank you for everyone watching. I thank you for everyone in the sound of my voice. I pray right now in the name of Jesus, God, that you would be close to them. You'd be near them. God, you would go with them into the deepest, darkest places of their life, and then you would bring them out. I thank you, God, that they would not live their life marked by works, but marked by grace. Thank you for what you're doing in the life of your people. I speak a blessing over them. And I thank you that you're turning things around in Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.